Good evening and welcome to the March 9th meeting of the Civil Service Commission. May we have roll call, please? Commissioner Gazarian? Here. Commissioner Manukian? Here. Commissioner Abkarian? Here. Chair Devine? Here. For the record, Commissioner Yakubian is absent. She, she, she just walked in. The door. <laughs> Commissioner Yakubian is here. Okay. And the first item, please. Minutes for the meeting of January 27th, 2016. Move to approve. Dispense from reading. Second. That's the unanimous consent. And the next item. Oral communications. I have no cards. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to address the commission on items not on the agenda? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next item. Recruitment and examination report. Mr. Doyle. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the commission, uh, this is uh, your recruitment and examination workload status report. This is a a note and file item, but uh, we do have this uh, brought before you each meeting. It shows all of our active recruitment processes and lists them by staff member, the position, filing date, and the testing dates uh, that are applicable. Um, this list has, uh, looks like a total of 54 processes currently going on. We tend to be hovering around 50 uh, as of the last few months. Um, again, as we finish some recruitments, new ones come in as a result of resignations and retirements and such. So uh, anyway, uh, if you have any questions on this uh, report, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Uh, otherwise, it is a note and file. Okay. Any questions? Seeing none, we'll note and file and move on. Eligible list established. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Chair, members of the commission, this is your eligible list that have been established since our last meeting uh, last month. <laughs> Uh, as you can see, the, work, the workload continues to be uh, fairly heavy. Um, we do have 10 new lists that have been uh, established. Uh, they are provided uh, for you. Uh, doesn't look like any that have very large candidate pools, but uh, most of them look like they're promotional. There's a couple open exams in there as well. Um, as, as always, uh, this, this report does include the total number of applications received for each of these recruitment processes. And then in the far right column are, are uh, the total number of uh, candidates that made it through the process and ultimately onto the eligible list. Uh, once again, this is a note and file item. If you have questions, uh, again, I'd be happy to try and answer those for you. Mr. Epkarian. Um, I just have one question. On um, job number 14-001498, what's a police officer lateral transfer merged? What, what, is, what does that mean? And as to the same question of Commissioner of Karian, 14 dash, does that mean it's a classification that was initially uh, made public in 2014? Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioners, uh, yes, the 14 it probably refers to the first time that that was, uh, that that requisition was, was brought forth. Um, to answer Commissioner Abkarian's question, uh, a, a lateral transfer is when we hire a police officer from another, from another agency, someone who's already a sworn officer, and get them to essentially transfer to our department. No, that, that I understood, that, that I know. I just said uh, 31 lateral transfers were requested and one was approved? Well, uh... Meeting that wrong or...? No, no. What, what uh, occurs is that uh, we have this as a bulletin that's posted pretty much when we post a police officer recruit and we receive applications for that uh, just like we do any other position. A good number of them are coming from people that aren't quite, uh, don't quite understand what a lateral transfer is. Uh, so probably 80% of them we have to disqualify just up front because they're not currently working as a police officer in another public agency. On this, we ended up with about five or six that really did meet the, the minimum requirements, and they're currently working in some other agency. Um, when we did the testing and called them to, to come, we only ended up with one individual who showed up. Um, not too uncommon uh, in this day and age. Uh, we, we kind of see a, a lot of drop-off in a lot of our, our applications. Uh, it's so easy to apply for a job these days online. You click a button and it's done. And uh, occasionally you have you know, a very, very low turnout. But yeah. my sense is the, the people that uh, applied for this originally either weren't serious about it or <clears throat> maybe weren't sure what they were applying for. But uh, ultimately, uh, as I said, we ended up with about five or six that that uh, truly met the qualifications, and then once we invited them to the exam process, uh, we, we only ended up with one. So. Qu 
question. Yes. Um, along the same lines, um, when you said you have 31 applications, I know we go through the background investigation, and, and that's a pretty lengthy and expensive process for our police officers. I'm assuming we don't start that up front, right? I mean, that's not, all of this gets weeded out? Okay. Well, Mr. Then Chair, uh, Commissioner Manukian, uh, the background investigation occurs at the very, very end of the process. Once we've done you know, the application screening, once we've done written exams, the oral boards, uh, physical agility, uh, then we, we proceed with the backgrounds because that's, that's a very time-consuming process, very expensive, lot, very labor-intensive, and that's at the far, far end. Okay, thank you. And you didn't do any of the foreground workup as to the 31. You just did it as to the five or six, right? That, that's, right. Correct. that's correct. Uh, what does that mean when, when we say police officer lateral transfer merged? Merged with what? It, it's a, it's a, a, we treat this as a continuous recruitment process. So as we receive a set of applicants for this group and put them on a list, uh, their names stay on the list for up to a year for, mm -hmm. for our open recruitments. And so we don't actually remove people from the list. So we keep the list. And then as we post the bulletin again, we merge new names on. I it, see. And okay. we keep merging new names on. And as people reach the maximum of two years on eligibility lists, then their names come off. Okay. Um, but uh, it's, it's a continuous recruitment process. We're, we're okay. continually merging names. Okay. Your motion. Move to approve. Second. Absolutely. I thought it was a note oh, line. Oh, I'm sorry. I, oh, you're file. right. Yeah. I'm getting ahead of myself. I withdraw my... Withdraw your motion and... Uh, but we wanted to approve it anyway. We will approve it. You yes. would have done it anyway. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Uh, next item. Class specification for approval, utility, construction, inspector. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Chair, members of the commission, this is a, uh, a class specification for approval. This is a new uh, position or a new classification, I should say. Um, this is a, uh, a utility construction inspector. is a field position within our water and power department. Uh, however, it works and reports out of our engineering section. And as you can see from the, the uh, specification, uh, it can uh, deal with uh, either water facilities or electric facilities or both. Um, previously, uh, when we've used this classification, we utilize the classification of construction inspector, which is kind of a generic classification that's typically used in the public works department uh, for our CIP projects. Um, the GWP facilities are... Uh, they're different. They have unique functions and certainly unique rules as far as, you know, who's allowed to work in and around electricity or potable water systems and things like that. So we felt it would be appropriate to have a more specific, uh, spe specifically defined classification uh, for the positions within the utility. So therefore, uh, um, that's what we have with this, this new classification. So. Uh, this does require a, a vote uh, of approval, and if you have further questions, I have uh, plenty of folks here. Mr. Nusessian worked on this recruitment from my office, and uh, uh, Mike DeGhetto is the Assistant General Manager for Water, and he's here as well if you have questions. Do you have any questions on that? No, except uh, the education. I suppose it doesn't require anything other than a GED. There is there's no need for any higher education for this other than uh, hands-on work experience and, that's, and that's climbing in and out of ditches from what I understand. Yes. Um, this is not a, uh, it's not an engineering job. It doesn't require an engineering degree or anything like that. So somebody could uh, do very well in this field uh, with uh, the requisite experience, but uh, education is not, uh, it's not primary in this. Thank you. For a motion on this one? Move to approve. Okay. Second. Second. Okay, that will be by unanimous consent. And we'll move on to the next item, please. Class specification for approval, police custody officer. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Chair, members of the commission, uh, this is, a uh, again, a, a new class specification for, uh, for the police custody officer series. Uh, this is a non-sworn, uh, non-safety, non-peace officer uh, position assigned to the Glendale City Jail. 
It's a very challenging uh, occupation, as you might expect. A very important position, interacting with uh, with arrestees and prisoners, assuring that they're processed, cared for uh, within our jail, in compliance with all the various correctional uh, statutes and the specialized training that uh, that that they receive. Uh, these individuals are subject to background investigation, as, as was referenced previously. Um, what we're doing here is uh, creating this classification. People, uh, the employees currently assigned to the jail right now are classified as community service officers, or CSOs. Uh, you might be familiar with that term. And uh, uh, we have CSOs doing work all over the uh, you know, police, uh, police uh, uh, building. But uh, uh, once again, uh, we felt that uh, this would be a more more appropriate to have their own uh, unique job classification. Um, and, and this is not unlike what we did a few years back with our communication operators. Uh, they used to be called CSOs as well, and there was a communication assignment or jail assignment or parking enforcement. Um, but uh, we, uh, we've we actually done a bit of uh, labor market surveys in this area, and uh, pretty much all of our surrounding police departments that have jails uh, actually have a, a unique, their own title, either correctional officer, custody officer, something along those lines. And uh, that's that's what we're, we're hoping to do here. Um, our intent is to therefore move all of our current CSOs that are assigned to the jail into this new classification, and uh, I'll talk about that uh, probably at our at our next meeting. But uh, for the most part, uh, we wanted to get the specification in place, and uh, that's what's uh, here before you this this evening. So if you have questions, uh, and I'd be happy to try and answer them. Uh, Russ Kwan is uh, our analyst with the uh, police department. Is here as is Juan Lopez, who's the uh, who's our jail administrator. Mr. Alkerin. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Carrion, it is it is both. There is a, a new classification involved, and the new classification does have does have a higher uh, salary attached to it. Um, and this was uh, it, this you know, part of the study that was done was designed to address compensation as well as making sure we have the appropriate classification. Okay. Sorry. Quick question. I, uh, I know this is a non-sworn position, and I guess that's where I'm a little bit con uh, not concerned. This is interacting with prisoners. Mm -hmm. And um, I know Mr. Lopez has always done a great job in, in running the facilities, and he knows the, that's his expertise. I, I want to just get a better clarification on, on the position when you're dealing with uh, people who've been arrested or uh, how does that work when you are a non-sworn um, does that I mean I just because I don't know the job very well I mean I spend a lot of time there but I don't know <laughs> the job. I have my own booth but um, how does that affect the the custody issues, and, sure. and do they also transport any prisoners? I believe so. Uh, um, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Manuki, and I'll probably, I'll probably ask uh, Juan to, to come up, uh, Mr. Lopez. Um, but it, it, good questions. Um, some agencies do use sworn peace officers in their jails. Uh, the biggest example is Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. In fact, they, all of their uh, jails are staffed by sworn deputies. I um, believe the, the prison, the state prison systems do, do it the same way. Most of your local uh, jails and your police agencies do use non-sworn uh, individuals, but uh, very similar work. Uh, but uh, um, I'll probably ask uh, Mr. Lopez to kind of draw the distinctions, both legally as, and as far as the job duties. So. The CSOs are also non-sworn, is that correct? I, I, absolutely, yes. yes, yes. But ca if you are sworn, can you be a CSO and be a sworn officer? Uh, no, no, we, okay. they're two separate. You get less uh, money if you're CSO. Yeah. If, sure. He spends a lot of time there too. <laughs> <laughs> 
spends a lot of time in the jail as uh, apparently Absolutely. Commissioner uh, Manukian. <laughs> Um, the non-sworn configuration is uh, something that's allowed uniquely in Southern California. Uh, the state of California is a large state, as we all know. And uh, the, the basis for having Type 1 jails is solely to keep your officers within your city, to provide an avenue for them to be able to take arrestees and to uh, deliver them back into the street so they can answer calls for service. Um, they are required to be certified uh, custody personnel. So that that's the component that you see in the bulletin that says that they're required to attend a correctional academy. But after 12 months? After 12 months. They, they're I, have a problem. I have a lot of questions, by the way, so please keep that. By all mind. means, you know, yeah, my, my ending is open. So um, the, the thing is, is that uh, unlike the Sheriff's Department, even though that uh, we do have 12 months to send them to a correctional academy, Right. Um, the Sheriff's Department hires folks and they send them straight through the academy at the onset. The problem uh, being with that, which the Sheriff's Department has, um, you know, identified, is that a lot of times they'll, they'll come out of the academy, they'll go down to the county jail, and they realize, wow, this is incredible. This is a lot more than I thought I was signing on for. And, uh, you know, so they end up losing a lot of people. Uh, the jail environment is not something that... Uh, for the most part, is, is, is a pleasant environment to work in. So it's, it's difficult to, to find people that are interested in doing that. Uh, we found a great deal of success of hiring people, exposing them to the jail environment. And, and then at that point in time, if we find that they're qualified and they're, they're, they're willing to accept this responsibility and work well in that environment, we'll send them to the academy. We have a 12 months to do so. But within that period, we can now you know, uh, school them, prepare them, and, and see if they're actually fit to work in this kind of an environment. And it works very, very well for us. It, it, it really does. But um, because they're, you know, non-sworn, it doesn't mean that they don't have responsibilities and the ability to, to handle custodial needs and, and anything that may arise within that environment. Um, it is an intensive academy. It is a formal academy. It is taught by the regular police uh, DIs that are there, and uh, they have to meet some very strenuous um, uh, physical and academic requirements while they're there. Um, I have one of uh, my senior custody officers who happens to be a GCA representative sitting behind me. Uh, he wrote one else. Uh, he went to one of those academies, and uh, he's, he's uh, been able to successfully uh, graduate from it. That's not to say that everyone does graduate from that. Uh, it is that strenuous. It is that difficult. Is it the same academy as the sworn officers go to? Yes, it is. It's the same academy. Uh, may I? Uh, let, let's take it one step at a time, sir. Sure. So based on this specification, we can hire someone mm -hmm. who's 18 years of age. Yes. Who has a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. And from having read this specification, mm -hmm. no experience whatsoever, right? except what we term to be uh, deal tactfully and courteously with the public, uh, learn new information, initiate improvements, learn penal vehicle and other codes. Yes. But we're talking about someone who essentially is with a GED or a high school diploma, mm -hmm. 18 years or older, no prior experience, and for the first 12 months, this person or persons such as this will be in charge of citizens who, but for an accusation, or be, perhaps because of an accusation, they are entitled to the very same constitutional safeguards and protections as you and I are under the Constitution, both under California and the United States. I'm a little troubled. Uh, I, I'm encouraged that, you know, we have those who have successfully gone through it, mm -hmm. and in my day job as a criminal defense attorney, I shudder to think that an 18-year-old kid, and that's what an 18-year-old is, mm -hmm. will subject the city of Glendale to God knows what kind of liability if they exercise poor judgment on any given occasion. And I think any 18-year-old is susceptible to exercising poor judgment just as much as a 55-year-old is these days, right? Yeah. Uh, so when we talk about a probationary 12-month period, mm -hmm. Uh, is this a scenario where someone is working there mm -hmm. 
who is going to be under the direct supervision of someone with a great deal of more of experience than he or she in this position, uh, which, if the, is the case, kind of makes me wonder why a higher salary is attached to this classification than a CSO. Mm -hmm. I recall in the past where uh, probationary police officers who did not seem to uh, meet the standard came here and asked for transfers to CSO status. Mm -hmm. At least I was in, in uh, I was enlightened and I was encouraged by the fact that that person had gone to police academy. Mm -hmm. Here, this is the person who has yet to go to any kind of an academy who's going to be sent if we think they're good enough to be sent. Mm -hmm. uh, the, other, the other three things that kind of stuck out, uh, it talks about learn and qualify in defensive tactics and in chemical and other non-lethal weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, how? Who's going to pay for this? Is the city paying for this? Or are they supposed to go learn this on their own uh, while they're also employed and making decisions that affect the accused as well as subject to potential liability the city? The other one uh, is successfully complete an approved formalized correctional course academy of instruction uh, within one year of hire. Is this up to them? Can they then decide, I'm going to go from day one, sign up, and attend, and now I have uh, expanded my knowledge and wherewithal as to how to deal with this stressful situation of someone whose freedom has been restricted by virtue of an arrest and is awaiting to be transported to court or otherwise. Uh, then we have things like read and comprehend street maps. I wonder why because they're not going to be transporting prisoners in the city, at mm -hmm. least I hope not, because they're certainly not sworn officers, and now that really poses a serious concern for me in terms of civil and human rights of someone who, are being, who we are now allowing to be guarded by essentially what I view to be an 18-year-old with no prior uh, higher training, education, or experience. Uh, we have remain calm and respond effectively in emergency situations. I want to say that'd be great, in a perfect world, but expecting that from someone without having them undergo training in advance, but putting them in a, in, in a, in a live situation, mm -hmm. that's, that's asking for trouble. Uh, so I don't know what the CSO requirements were, if they were any more uh, stricter than this or more meatier than this. This seems to be very skeletal to me. Maybe I'm just paranoid, but well, I'd rather be paranoid today than, uh, you know, concerned sure. tomorrow. So, so those are my initial impressions. If I, 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 just to, just Sorry, I just want to pick, I, I'm assuming that this individual, when it gets hard, day one is not going to be turned over and say, okay. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, You're absolutely right. Okay. Not any more so. Not any more so than, than we would do with a police officer that just graduated from the academy. Um, pr 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 I'm sorry. Pr prisoner rights is something very, uh, very unique and specific, and highly technical and specified. Mm -hmm. To suggest that we would have a class specification that says experience, no specific requirement, mm -hmm. that is troublesome because people get accused and, and arrested all times. Mm -hmm. We would want at least someone to adhere to their basic standards of rights and privileges that are still uh, theirs until they are convicted of felonies and perhaps they lose some of those rights. Uh, those are very good questions and, I, and I, I appreciate you posing those. Let me add some clarification in regards to your uh, first question uh, in regards to being an 18 year old. Sure. When a police officer goes ahead and uh, goes through the entire process. Our folks go through the same entire process that a police officer does. They're posed questions that are geared towards common sense, mm -hmm. towards maturity, and to understanding that they have a certain aptitude to be able to respond intelligently to very serious situations. And uh, our people are not uh, absent of that in terms of the, the, the process. Not everybody that graduates from the police academy is qualified to be a police officer. That's True. one. True. And, and the very fact that we put these folks with a training officer, they're not set off on their own. Just like uh, you know, Commissioner Mnookin said, they're put with a, a training officer. 
They're never set free on their own until they, they graduate from the academy and they've shown aptitude and they've, they've met the minimum requirements. Within that, we, we keep them for about two or three months with the training officer. Within that two or three months, if they haven't shown appropriate aptitude and ability to do the job, they're dismissed. And that's, that's it. Are you referring to police officers now, or are you I'm referring, referring to, to custodial officers? Custodial officers. I see. I'm referring to custodial officers. Okay. So the, the training process is very strenuous. Our, our operation um, generally gets a lot of folks from field services from, that are police officers mm -hmm. that, while they were out there, felt, this really isn't for me. Maybe I could try something else. Maybe I, I'll, I'll do better in a custodial setting. And we'll get them in a custodial setting. That may not be entirely for them either, but sometimes they have a little bit more training in there, a little bit more time to be able to hone in on some of their skills. So we, we try to go ahead and build uh, staff to the very best of our ability. In terms of training, uh, it's state funded. Okay, so it's, it's provided to us in terms of a grant. Police officers are funded through a post, police officer standards for, for training. My staff are funded through the standards for trainings for corrections. So all that's funded through them. And uh, the, the training is pretty extensive. What I require of my training officers, as, as I do with Mr. Frasso, who's sitting behind me, is that they keep them for a period of up to two to three months. And they're not just required to identify specific shortfalls that they may identify. They're required to identify three components associated with how they can best resolve that shortfall. And then this person needs to demonstrate the ability to be able to reconcile that the deficiency. And if they're unable to do that, they don't progress to the next phase. So the training is pretty in intensive. It is very similar to a police officer. They are let to be, uh, well, they, they are, you know, given the direction that they must complete all these very strict specifications and meet all those requirements before they move on to the next phase. Not everybody makes it. And I've got to tell you, um, it is pretty strenuous. In this day and age, in terms of uh, working with the clientele that we have and in terms of the compensation, it has gotten more challenging, just like it has for police officers. And, you know, our staff is... Uh, as they've been able to demonstrate through their review, underpaid by comparison to other cities. And you have some uh, seasoned people like Bill Torrey and uh, pe people who have wealth of knowledge. I've got training officers that have been with me for about 20 to 25 years. Um, I would say about 65% of my staff has a BA or higher. Um, they're very, very educated, very, very talented people. When you're talking about your staff, who do you mean? You're talking about people that are running the jail? People that work for me, yes. Okay. All right, because I'm familiar with Mr. Torley, and I have no qualms about Mr. Torley, <laughs> but I don't know anybody else. He's making so, changes, Don. <laughs> I don't know anybody. You, you know, you, yeah. sir, you're saying that not everybody makes it, and I appreciate that. It. Yes. But it seems to me that everybody makes it from day one. On day one, everybody starts off, and they have custodial duties and responsibilities that affect a person in custody. Because uh, they've been able to demonstrate by means of going through the process as Mr. Doyle. Okay, so when is that? Is that prior to them getting on the job? Yes. Okay, that's what I'm trying to, that's what I'm lost on. Let me I'm thinking you're office. hiring them and then they're learning on the job and I'm thinking, well, wait a <laughs> minute. An interview process. An interview I, process. Yes. Let me, let me yes. help out here. Okay. I, you know, Mr. Lopez answered all the tough questions. May I'll, I'll answer the easy ones as far as. I didn't ask any tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying not to ask You asked a lot of questions and I was right. trying to write them down. But I can't. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, as far as the, the minimum qualifications for this job, uh, they are the exact the same for this as for the CSO. And it's the same with police officer recruit and firefighter recruit and, uh, you know, electrical apprentice. Mm -hmm. uh, we have certain positions uh, in this city that are very important, very key positions that pay very well in some respects that have no minimum requirements. And the idea is, you know, we hire good people off the street, we put them through a battery of tests, and we provide all the training for them. In the case of the apprentices in the electrical and water department, that's like 
four and a half, five years of training for a police officer. It's academy and then one year on probation. And for these folks, a solid one year of, of learning. But uh, in, this, in this process, uh, this is the same process to get this job as, as we had uh, when they were under the classification of CSO. Um, basically, uh, you know, they, they apply. Um, we have uh, you know, the selection process. Generally, it's a written exam, an oral board. Um, we do uh, a background investigation, which is very extensive. And you, you've, seen, you've seen some of the appeals on backgrounds, the issues they get into. A lot of it has to do with maturity and people's ability to react and how they've lived their lives uh, up to this point. Um, there's also you know, a full battery of physical exams, including a, a psychological exam. And uh, that, that, is that not right? Yes, it is. There's, there is a psych involved. So if somebody does not have the appropriate uh, you know, propensity for dealing with conflict or dealing with, you know, with people who, you know, who get arrested and you know, they have a tendency to lose their temper or act in a way that would bring dishonor to this organization, I can assure you they're not going to pass our, our psychological background. So there's a huge battery of exams just to get in the door here and uh, so the, the the idea that you know we're taking an 18 year old with no experience no life and throwing them into this job uh, it it's not a good characterization uh, and, and that that's just to get get here and then as as mr. Lopez will will attest once they get here they're under very strict supervision and you know they go through academies and have to learn all kinds of uh, various things uh, in order to, to do their job well. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of what it takes to, 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 get, to, to get in this profession. And, and uh, I, I, I got to say, we, uh, um, often we will start out with lots of applications, uh, hundreds of them, and to get to that, you know, it's kind of like a funnel. They all come in and then very few make it out. Uh, we've had lots of issues, uh, particularly in the areas of background and, and in the medical and in the psychological. Um, we, can, we can start out with three, 400 applications and end up with a list of maybe 10 to 12. And, 10 then of, 12. and, and of that, yes. we'll see at least half of those fail the background. Are they polygraphed? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. And Commissioner uh, Kazarian. Um, I, I've got to tell you, the last testing phase that we had, um, we, we were able to secure at least uh, one person that we physically hired. And uh, it, this person was not 18, they were far, well, much older, much mature. And uh, they soon realized that this was not the environment for them. Um, the Sheriff's Department tells me, out of every academy that they have, they can have an academy of about 60 people. And out of every academy that they have, they're lucky if they can retain 10 to 15. 10 to 15, that's a huge number. And uh, the, the reason being that you can't just hire somebody off the street with a job's definition and just throw them in that kind of an environment. What we do is gradually expose them to this environment. If they demonstrate that they don't have the maturity to uh, work in this kind of environment, not everybody that's 18 year old is gonna pass the oral interview. The oral interview is conducted by seasoned and trained custody officers and police officers as well. And not every 21-year-old police officer has a maturity or well, the life experience to be a police officer. I know this because they've come to work for me. You know, that's, why I, that's why I'm not raising the issue of why 18 and not 21, yeah. which is the requirement for peace officers. Right. Uh, um, and I tell you. Because there's not much of a difference. <laughs> <laughs> Those are very good questions, and, and they're very legitimate questions for a lot of people to pose. For, for, for the most part, a lot of people don't know what a type 1 jail is. It only really exists in the state of California. And, and the sole purpose for it is because the enormity of, of the size of this state um, and, and, and what's really needed. If you're looking at inland valley, valley cities like Azusa, Covina, and a lot of these cities that are inland valley, if there was not a type 1 jail or resource for them, and they're putting out four units out in the field, and they now affect three arrests, they would have to leave their city, go to the county jail. Who would be patrolling that city? A lot of people look at it from the standpoint of, oh, this is a full-size jail. It serves one, one purpose, and, and it's to uh, hold people for the purpose of arraignment. But we're obligated by the state to hold the same standards as if though 
the custody people that are non-sworn there work in a sworn type of facility, like if they were deputy sheriffs or correctional deputies. So they have to meet pretty much the same requirements, even though they don't fall under the sworn classification. And the reason for that being is because they're, they're not given the powers of arrest. They're not going to be out there arresting people and, and, and that, that type of thing. But they need to understand the community. They need to know the streets. They need to know everything that's around here so they can uh, appropriately fill out whatever is required within that paperwork that they have to complete and know everything that, that surmises their, their responsibilities. I'm satisfied, sir. Thank you for your explanation. I think... Uh uh, given uh, the safety measures of training and weeding out process that you've set out, uh, I'm hopeful and, and, and dare I say, dare right I say, confident that uh, <laughs> the process will uh, be as fluid as it has been with the CSO uh, endeavor. Because I haven't had any concerns that I've ever heard of uh, coming out of the Glendale Jail. Uh, and I've been practicing law for quite some time, so I'm, I'm based on that. I'm satisfied. Thank you. Move to Thank approve. You, okay, I, I do have one question. Oops. I may. <laughs> Thank you for the hospitality. Really thought I can <laughs> get that in. Great service, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, what are you? Are you staying there once in a while? <laughs> I have my own room there. <laughs> Concierge and everything. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, what I want to know is you've mentioned the word you're you hiring uh, these new C these new uh, custody officers. And we also know you have a cadre of CSOs. And I was under the impression at the outset that this was just a transfer or a promotion of the existing staff to the new position. So could you clarify that? Yes, and if so, uh, if it is the existing CSOs that are moving over to custody officers, uh, will they require more training pursuant to this new job spec? No. Um, uh, Chair Devine. Uh, they are the same staff. Uh, what we're just doing is basically changing. Yeah, the Mr. Name. Chair, I, again, I'll, I'll answer the easy question if, if there's more more in depth. But uh, um, the uh, you're you're correct. The the uh, our attempt would be to take the existing CSO crop of CSOs who are assigned to the jail and transition them into these new jobs, the new titles. Every single one of them. Um, under civil service, there's a little bit of a, a, a process that we have to go through because essentially we're taking we're taking a uh, a job classification CSO at this salary range and making them custody officers at this salary range, and so we're talking about new classification and a different level of pay. Uh, therefore, we either have to do a recruitment process, and it would be a promotional recruitment process, or uh, what I intend to do and what I'd like to bring back at our next meeting would be a, a sort of a rarely used uh, provision of our civil service rules that uh, is called recognized attainment. And it's the, the process of, of uh, recognizing the individual's specific training, certifications, and uh, whatever the qualifications and essentially transitioning them from one classification to another and bypassing uh, any type of formal recruitment process. And um, probably due to the Brown Act, I can't get into a lot of the details of that, but that, uh, that's what we uh, hope to do uh, at our next meeting. Because uh, it seems like they're getting more money, but they're doing the same job. Are we, have we determined that what the job that they're doing deserves more money and deserves a different yes. title? Is as that it? As a matter of fact, yes. So that we can hold on to them for a longer term as opposed to them being disenchanted with the pay for the amount of services they provide and then leave us hanging and go for greener pastures. But I heard that, it, that when you actually did a survey of the, of the outlaying cities that that job paid more with that with a different title so I just see. to keep them yeah. it seems like that's that's what the reasoning is for this behind this whole thing and they have to deal with the criminal defense attorneys uh, <laughs> okay. those criminal defense that's why it itself requires a raise <laughs> which i love very much by the way oh okay we've had a move, move to approve move to approve uh, second actually commissioner i'm carrying oh, no, no, no. it's good it's good Second. Thank you, sir. Thank okay, you. We have unanimous consent on that. Thank you very much, Juan. Appreciate See you it. you soon. <laughs> and we'll move on to the next item. Job bulletin for approval, fire engineer. Move to approve. <laughs> Second. Second. <laughs> uh, I, 
I'm going to have to say I have some questions on that one, unfortunately. Yeah. I withdraw. So I I'd like uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Doyle to uh, introduce it, and then I do I, have some questions. I actually am a commissioner in another city. I, uh, oh. Commissioner Doyle, will you please uh, brief us it's, it's, from Burbank? It's, here it's Director Doyle. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'll be brief. Uh, this is a job bulletin for fire engineer. Uh, it's because uh, uh, this is a sworn public safety position, our rules do require that this bulletin be brought to the commission uh, for your approval before it's posted. Um, one, uh, uh, because we had canceled our last two meetings um, uh, and we needed to get <coughs> this bulletin posted uh, in, a timely, in a timely fashion, um, due to the schedule, the, the fire department and the various things they have going on, uh, we did seek uh, prior approval from the chair. That's something I rarely do, but uh, do, given the time frames of this, uh, I communicated with the chairman Devine, and he was gracious enough to allow us to sort of administratively open this with the provision and the understanding that we bring this back to the full commission for, for its approval. Um, so that's, uh, that's why we're, we're bringing this here. This has already been open. Uh, it was open effective February 16th. So uh, we're kind of doing this backwards. But uh, again, if uh, the commission has uh, questions, you know, we can try and answer them. Chief, uh, Battalion Chief Probst is here. And uh, this is another Russ, Russ Kwan uh, production, so. Okay. And since I'm the only one that has a question, I think, I'm going to open it up if uh, Peter Probst come up. Uh, my questions fall into two areas. One is uh, the, I'm, what I'm calling whether or not the exam is going to be fair and equitable to all the candidates. And when I see a bulletin that uh, does away with a certain uh, requirement, I'm, I'm concerned that uh, perhaps some of the candidates will be put at a disadvantage uh, by this happening at this time. So I'm wondering if you could explain, uh, again, specifically uh, why I read it, if a existing one of the candidates already has taken this driving course, the Smith driving course, or has taken advantage of it, and then the rest of the candidates, because of this bullet, no longer have to do that. It appears from my perspective that that one candidate is at a disadvantage because the others didn't have to do what he did to get that position. So could you enlighten us on that aspect and align my fears on that? Certainly. Uh, Chair Devine and uh, Commissioners, thank you very much, City Staff. Um, Tom Probst, uh, Battalion Chief, sign of the Training and Safety Section of the uh, Fire Department. And uh, first I want to thank uh, Mr. Doyle and uh, the uh, Commission for uh, allowing this process to approve uh, prior to our uh, previous meetings. Um, we do have five candidates that have applied for the, uh, for the position. But to answer your question, Chair Devine, <clears throat> and uh, sorry if this seems... Uh, or sounds a little confusing, but the Smith driver training course that uh, you're you're asking about is a a company that assists companies, or in this case, our fire department, in developing, creating, and organizing a driving course. Uh, our department years ago solicited this company for input, and we sent a number of our personnel, a handful of our personnel, to uh, this training to become what's called train the trainers. So we sent them away. They learned how to develop a driving course. They learned uh, some specifics for safe driving. They returned and then they in turn uh, dispersed that and over through oversight trained our internal personnel, sworn personnel. So um, at that time, the, uh, the training was in a civilian vehicle, in a van. They took six or eight at a time in a city van, drove around through the city and identified um, safety issues in driving, such as uh, which lanes to drive in, especially with emergency vehicles, with um, traffic coming from the sides, with vehicles parked um, in residential areas where you may have uh, children playing or, or balls entering the street looking for hazards like that. So it taught uh, lane positioning, lane driving, proper speeds, um, as well as uh, visual driving of, of looking ahead, looking at your stop signs, your street lights, identifying hazards in front of you, as well as to the side and behind you as you're driving. So having a 360 vision at all times while you're driving any vehicle, a civilian vehicle, a sedan, or an ambulance, or a large uh, fire apparatus. So. 
uh, there was a certain fee, and it was several thousand dollars we paid this company. And each year, uh, they would require uh, our trainers to return for a update or a uh, refresher training. Um, through the past several years, with, with the budget reductions as they, they were, um, our, our chief and command staff uh, made a decision that it was cost prohibitive or in intent we weren't getting uh, out of it really what we, were, what we were paying into it. And we were incorporating what we had learned in those classes and trainings and to this day continue to implement uh, what was learned there. The only um, element we don't have today is when we train someone specifically, we do not give them a certificate with the Smith driver training logo on it. We have incorporated that into a hybrid training into our, into our fire training where to qualify for this exam that's in question, there is, there is two requirements specific to driver uh, training and operation. One is a operator 1A course, which is a 40 hour class, which teaches the operator specific to fire apparatus of how to drive, how to do a pre-check, how to um, refreshes on DMV rules and regulations, and, um, and some pumping and operation in that sense. The other option was to be a certified acting engineer, which qualified you for this exam. Uh, in our department, which has been for, for a long time, to be a certified acting engineer, it is a testing process that a candidate says, I'd like to be an acting engineer. Um, in that position, an acting engineer can be used when the permanent engineer is away, maybe in training, maybe in a class, uh, maybe in a meeting. Um, we still need someone to operate that equipment um, safely and knowingly how to do that. So we, we train people at the firefighter rank where they can move up into an acting position of engineer. So they go through uh, nearly the same exam as the engineer's exam to be an acting engineer. And part of that acting engineer test is a driving component or a rodeo, we call it, driving around town, parking, parking uphill, parking downhill, backing into diminished alleys, um, backing down long, long alleys or driveway curved roads, um, very detailed. So we, we took what we learned years ago when we paid for this training from a company, and we've incorporated that into our program years ago and, and still today. Um, and we'll always have that component in our, in our training program and requirements to be a safe operator. So, we, uh, we have one applicant who actually was trained years ago, has that certificate, but all the applicants have been trained under what was taught and brought back to us in our normal daily operation and training. So our standards uh, are consistent or even have increased with our um, necessity and our, our detail to driver's training and performance for the uh, daily operation and into our exam requirements. Okay. So other than that certificate that that one candidate has, uh, he cannot say that uh, the other five that don't have that certificate have any less knowledge or skill or training than he had in order to get the certificate. They're all on a level playing field in that area. Is, yes, sir. Is that a yes. safe assumption? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. The second concern I had was uh, in the <coughs> staff report, <coughs> it says, uh, the uh, Smith driving course uh, provides training that reduces the risks involved in driving. And then you go on to say, or staff goes on to say, that the fire department uh, personnel obtain driving practices by through other means, including education, et cetera. There's nothing in here that tells me uh, that the other driving practices or other means provide the same level of uh, reduction of risk that they would get by taking a Smith course. So again, I wanted to ask a very simple question. Can we assume that these other driving courses that you offer are equivalent to the Smith driving course? Yes, sir, they are, and, and they are the Smith course brought back, just not. Uh, the only difference now is the, the candidate or the employee doesn't receive a certificate with the Smith logo on it saying you completed a course as, as designed by them. They taught us how to design the course, how to train our people, and we do that now internally. Uh, so we are consistent or we are more even stringent okay. uh, in detail. So it's, it's equivalent. We're not uh, increasing the city of Glendale to more risk 
by having candidates that don't have the full training <coughs> in the Smith? No, okay. sir. No, sir. With that, is there a motion? Move to approve. I have one question. Oh, I'm sorry, do you have a question? I, I only have a question. This is not unusual, is it? I mean, other cities, other fire departments do in-house training as well. I suppose not everybody goes to this, whatever course it is, this... Uh, Smith driver training. Right. Yeah. They're not the only game in town, right? Correct. This is just a company that offers a service to help you design okay. a driving course. And based on Chair Devine's inquiry, I'm understanding that all of the training that was provided by this company is now being provided in-house, and as you put it, even perhaps more stringently than... Yes, what sir. What would have been on the outside? Yes, sir. All right, okay. thank you. Uh, I do have one other item I wanted to ask or talk about. <clears throat> In the uh, next to the last paragraph of the staff report, it says Fire Department Management will be visiting the requirements for all ranks in the near future and will update the class specifications as required. And I wanted to expand on that because. Uh, this commission has been, uh, I won't say inundated, but uh, given several changes in job bulletins where things are removed, uh, I won't go into detail on that, but where changes are made. And I would like to uh, say that not only should fire department be looking into looking at the job specifications prior to initiating an exam in order to avoid this commission having to, on the spot, uh, reduce, or as one of our old commissioners used to say, dumb down a exam uh, in order to get something approved immediately. So if I could ask uh, our director, commissioner, to uh, take that into consideration, and in the future, if you could start some sort of program, not only with fire, but with all the departments, where they go through a, a review of the job specs, if they want to reduce something, that's the time to do it not when it comes back as a job bulletin. So certainly, Chair Devine, that's, and that's a, an excellent point. And that's, that's the purpose of uh, why we, we stated that. Uh, um, as you know, the specification is, sets the framework for what that job consists of. Uh, when we post the bulletin, um, and we do it all the time. I mean, every week we have bulletins being posted. And if, if we have to ask for a modification to that specification, of course, we bring that back to, to the commission for your, your approval. And I think, uh, you know, it, you, you've probably seen a lot of this coming from the fire department because I think in, in years past, uh, the, uh, the current chief, previous chief, and the one before that, a very strong emphasis on education in certain classes, certain training offered by the state, you know, fire marshal's office and, and you know, really strong emphasis on training and certifications. And what we end up finding is that uh, either a lot of these courses no longer exist or they've been modified uh, by some factor or, <coughs> or uh, they may exist or a certification may exist, but not in a sufficient uh, uh, number of classes that would make it fair for candidates preparing for that position. You may have somebody who, who wants to become a fire engineer, but that course isn't offered until, you know, next January or something like that. And it, uh, it does create a, a, a conflict in us in our ability to get good candidates who are otherwise would be well qualified. So yeah, we don't like having to come to you and continually ask for a modification to this and that. So I think uh, uh, we will certainly take that to heart and listen to what you, you've said. And I think that's what the effort is, is going to be. And we, we need to do this in uh, police as well, uh, because uh, uh, yeah, there, are, there are situations with those bulletins where we'll look at something and say, hmm, you know, this doesn't apply. I, I had to, uh, you know, we, we recruited last year for fire chief. and. I don't recall the specifics, but one of the uh, one of the courses that was part of that minimum requirements for that position uh, doesn't exist any longer. It was a fire marshal's uh, something or other certification, and so we had to take that out. Obviously, otherwise we'd we'd either confuse a lot of candidates or or not get any candidates at all. So. Excellent points, and we'll uh, we'll do our best to, to look at those. In fact, we've had our last bi-monthly with our firefighters association. This was a, a topic of discussion, and we we uh, are actually going to be working very closely with them uh, as well on this this effort. So, okay. thank you, Chair, Chair Devine. If I just may make a 
a comment on that. Um, we are working close with Human Resources because uh, December 31st of this year, all of the current recognized state fire training courses uh, related to the fire department and promotional exams uh, are all going away. They're changing their entire curriculum throughout the state. So January 1 of 17, uh, all these classes you're seeing on these bulletins for the last uh, couple decades will no longer exist or be recognized. So um, we're working with uh, Matt and his staff to create a, a crosswalk um, to make that, that work. But uh, next year will be all new curriculum coming out from the state. So there's a, a good timing that we, we have to do this. Um, Correct the bulletins. And that's tricky, too, because you have people who took the old classes, and you don't want to forget about them. And then you have the future to think about what the new classes are going to be called. And so, as he says, it's kind of a crosswalk, uh, making sure that, you know, everyone's, everyone's qualifications are, are reflected uh, as they apply for these jobs. So, um, again, something we'll work on. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, I, I would like. To, I just would like to see in the future when, when, whenever these bulletins are up, there's always an entry. Like in this one, there is. It says the Glendale Firefighters Association has been given the opportunity <coughs> to review the job bulletin. It never takes it to another sentence and says they're okay with it. <laughs> it's like, what does that mean? You know. And then, you know, it kind of makes me say, well, okay, nobody's here complaining about it, so they must be okay. But. It would be good to have to, to keep the management associations engaged and at least get a nod from them of yay or an a nay so that there's no issues down the line that, well, they didn't respond, but they didn't really go along with it either. That's, that's, that's a great point, and, and I think uh, it's safe to assume that if they're not here, they are okay with it. But the reason why we don't write that next question sometimes is, or that next sentence, is that... Um, you know, we're working on these bulletins. We're busy. I mean, staff is spread pretty thin. They finish the this the staff report and the bulletin draft, send it to the association. We try to do that like two weeks ahead of time prior to the meeting. Uh, we don't always hear back from them, or we don't always necessarily get to them. Uh, you know, we could do better getting that getting it to them in a timely manner. I don't want to put put it on the associations, but oftentimes we won't hear back from them by the time that we have to turn in these items for the agenda. We have our meetings every other Wednesday, uh, and we try to get the entire agenda done by the preceding Wednesday, Thursday, usually it's Thursday, and we send it out, as you know, either late late Thursday night or, or uh, early uh, Friday morning. And, and quite frankly, we don't always have that answer by then. If something does come up between then and now, we'll, we'll, we'll pull the item and, uh, and hold it back. But, yeah, because clearly they've been uh, given a notice and an opportunity to respond. Mm -hmm. Be nice that they would respond so that there is no issue in the future that sure. they say, well, we never got to it or sure. no, guys we guys approved it without our input and things like we, that. So. We have good relations with our employee associations, and quite frankly, if, if someone were to, to uh, uh, say, you know, at the last minute, hey, we're not really comfortable with this, uh, nine times out of ten, we'll, we would just pull it and say, let's move it to the next meeting. That's just kind of the, the relation we have. So um, the next item we have, uh, we have kind of an example of that. So we'll, okay. we'll move discuss. to approve. Okay. Is there second. A second? We have unanimous consent on that. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Thank Steve. You. Next, please. Another one. Job bulletin for approval, IS project manager. Quan has been busy. Ernie is keep. Mr. Chair, members of the commission, uh, this item is a is a job bulletin for approval. And uh, as I said, there's certain circumstances that we bring bulletins. You know, often, if it's a, you know, safety sworn promotional uh, or if we're changing the minimum qualifications, uh, in this circumstance, this is being brought before you because. Uh, uh, this is a bulletin that had previously been recruited for on a promotional basis, meaning it was restricted to our own city employees. And uh, this time we're attempting or requesting that it be done on, a, on, a, on an open basis, which will open it up and give us you know, the opportunity to uh, have sort of a broader uh, applicant pool to select from. Uh, this bulletin is largely uh, consistent with its approved class specification with 
two exceptions. And uh, you know, as, as you leaf through this, you're probably wondering, this is the longest bulletin you've probably ever seen. And uh, it's not lost upon me, but uh, <laughs> um, what, we, what we're doing in this, this is a, we have several employees in this classification of information services project manager uh, in our IT department. And uh, this one, this specific opening is going to be the person who would uh, manage our help desk and our, uh, and our PC support unit. Um, so we, we, we kind of want to customize the bulletin to attract somebody with those particular skills, somebody with you know, the appropriate level of patience. technical know-how, but lots of patience. Lots and good, of patience. Good managerial and supervisory experience is what we're, we're hoping to find. Um, interesting, you know, that the, the issue of employee associations comes up. Uh, this is a, an example of, uh, of, you know, we had Mr. Kwan sent this bulletin out to our uh, association that is covered by this position, which is the Glendale Management Association. They reviewed it and actually uh, had a suggestion. Uh, you know, this is a, you know, a mid-management level position. It pays well. It's very important, very key. Lots of super, supervision and management. Uh, this job should require a degree, and uh, you know we thought, gee, that's you know that's a good point, and let's let's discuss this with the, the department. And we sat down and discussed it. Uh, Brian Ganley, who is the um, uh, the chief information officer, he's the head of the department. Uh, we brought this to him, and he said, you know what, that's a very good suggestion. And so, uh, based on the GMA. Uh, uh, recommendation. We are, in fact, uh, uh, including a bachelor, bachelor's degree requirement for this position. Um, so it's just kind of an example of how that process does work sometimes. Uh, so again, this is uh, a bulletin for your approval. Again, it's, it's brought before you due to the fact that we're seeking an open recruitment and we have those modifications. Uh, this does require a uh, vote of the commission, so if you have questions, be happy to try and answer them. Uh, again, once again, this is one that Russ Kwan worked on, and we have Brian Ganley uh, sitting in the back. He's, uh, he's our chief information officer, uh, uh, if you have questions as well. So. Move to uh, second. Slowly second. Uh, he's, he sat no, here the second. Move to approve. <laughs> oh. I just I have one question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said, okay. no. Who knows? Sorry. That may lead me to ask three other follow-up questions. <laughs> so I, just a kind of academic questions. Uh, is there an existing project manager that now for this? Mr. Chair, members of the commission, yes, there are several IS project managers working for the city presently. Oh, in your shop. Yes, sir. Um, they only exist in, in the Information Services Department. So if you have existing ones and you're going to be requiring that they have bachelor degree now by this job bulletin, does that mean those, all those project managers are going to have to apply now for this position, assuming they have the bachelor degree? I, I will defer to Mr. Doyle, but um, I don't believe that's the case. No. Um, that this is only a going forward requirement. Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Ganley has, uh, is it four uh, information services project managers in the department? Or I believe three? so. Okay, and they're doing other, they're managing other projects. The vacancy that occurred here was as a result of somebody leaving the city, and we're use, using this classification to uh, oversee the help desk functions and the, the uh, PC uh, PC uh, <laughs> specialist group. Um, as far as the other, the other information services project managers, uh, I some of them do have degrees, some of them do not. Uh, we would not impose a requirement on them, uh, you know, retroactively and make them go out and go back to school. Uh, so this would be a, a going forward basis for whoever it is that gets hired into this position. Okay. There's been a motion, and I believe a second, and we have <clears throat> unanimous consent. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Civil Service Commission staff comments. 
Seeing none. Well, oh, I'm sorry. We have staff. I, I, I actually do have two two comments. The first is sort of a housekeeping <laughs> matter. Uh, uh, our next meeting is scheduled for March 23rd, and as I began to speak uh, under our very lengthy discussion about the police custody and it, it probably more information that you ever wanted to know about our jail and its employees, uh, but uh, uh, I would like to bring an item back at our next meeting, which will require the full commission attendance, all five of you. Um, it's a process, without getting into too much detail, it's a process called recognized attainment. And uh, according to uh, Rule 5, Section 10 of the rules, to pass this uh, uh, would, uh, would require an affirmative vote of all the members of the commission. So Did you say the 23rd? I believe the, excuse me, Wednesday. 23rd. 23rd? Yeah. And say the 23rd. Okay. So I, I'd just like so to you know, 23rd, I'm testifying as an expert witness. I don't know how long that case is going to go. So I, if it, it's most likely going to be an all day thing, mm -hmm. but uh, I'll, I'll talk to you tomorrow about. It. Okay. So there's okay. a small chance that I might not be here. Okay. Uh, but I'll. I'll okay. And uh, you know, on those, I have to be there. I don't know when I'll go on the stand. Okay. okay, I'll talk to you. But that is my hope that the full commission can convene at some point in order to do this. Uh, uh, again, it's it's something, uh, it's a process that went about, came as a result of a labor market survey, and the, the we'd like to facilitate this as quickly as we can and avoid having to do an exam. Lab. So uh, we'll, we'll have some more communication then about that. Um, the second thing, uh, a little bit of sad news, and I think all, many of you are going to be shocked, but uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, we're losing a member of our staff. Uh, Mr. Russ Kwan is, uh, is leaving uh, the city of Glendale. He's I was kidding. <laughs> Boy, well, thank you, Sam. See? Boy. <laughs> Please are you in better pastures. Really? Civil service has not approved yeah. his departure. <laughs> Don't we have to vote on that? <laughs> Can we deny the leave? I wish you could. I wish you could. Uh, Russ uh, applied and, and competed uh, for a position with an organization called the Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts. They're a special government uh, agency that uh, uh, plays a very key role in the, in the environmental uh, 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 process uh, in the Los Angeles County region. The, the uh, county sanitation districts runs... Uh, uh, landfills and wastewater treatment plants, and uh, they're they're located out in Whittier, California. And Ooh. Russ, they're a, you know, a government agency. Russ has been hired as their supervising human resources analyst, so uh, it comes with it uh, a very good promotion for him, a great opportunity, and he'll be overseeing a small staff. And uh, you know, overall, it's a good uh, a good promotion for him. But uh, we certainly are very, very sorry to see him go, and uh, you know it, it, it creates a big, a big uh, uh, loss to our department. But uh, you know, uh, on the other hand, uh, when you when you develop good employees, um, you know, part of the uh, the uh, the process is sometimes seeing them leave for for greener pastures. So uh, we wish Russ a great deal of luck in his new job, and uh, we will miss him very much. So. No matter does what the Commissioner Gazarian said, we still love you. But okay. the good part is I'll get to see you still, because uh, the Regional Quality uh, Water Board also is in the same building. I, I deal with them all the time, so <laughs> I'll be seeing when you. you. <laughs> when is your last day, Russ? Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, my last day with the city will be Monday, March 14th. March 14th? Yes. This is really unacceptable. <laughs> but don't, doesn't he have to give 30-day notice? <laughs> but thank you for everything you've done. We always kid with you because we really appreciate everything you've done. And don't be a stranger. We'll come and find no you. I wonder half the agenda was Quan, Quan, Quan. <laughs> we got everything we can get out of him. Best of luck. Thank you very much. I'm going to miss you, Russ. Yeah, same here, and thanks for all of the great service. You certainly deserve the promotion, and they're getting a, a great person to work with them. So we will miss you. 
I definitely will miss my interactions with you as a commission, and I appreciate the opportunity that Mr. Doyle gave me uh, as an HR analyst here with the city. So, again, thank you very much for, for everything over the past 12 years. Thank you. Thank Good you. luck. Good. Any more good news? <laughs> you got anything else to ruin my evening with? No. I, I, will, I will point out uh, you're probably not seeing uh, Miss uh, Amy Martin very much lately. She is uh, on a project, um, and, and we, we talked about this uh, a little bit last year in, as we brought some uh, uh, specifications to you for approval. And there's a project we're doing, uh, uh, Enterprise Resource Planning uh, System. We're redoing our entire budget, payroll, and HR automated system. And it's a massive project, uh, which is going to take... Uh, probably in the neighborhood of two to three years. And uh, Ms. Martin, as well as uh, a couple of other members of my staff, are pretty much on this project full time. Uh, and it's a, you talk about, you know, losing staff, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be devastating to lose Russ Kwan. But uh, on the other hand, it, it is, it's been quite challenging to lose uh, Ms. Martin. She's uh, our assistant department head and my right hand on so many things. Uh, so she's, uh, but she's working hard. She's coming in. I see her a few minutes in the morning, and then she goes to the, really to our IS department, which is in the Perkins building, and then, uh, you know, she comes back for a few minutes at the end of the day, and we debrief. And uh, but uh, you probably won't be seeing much of her at commission. And I just wanted to clarify as, the, as to the reasons for that. So um, it's going to be a, a tough, uh, tough couple of years with that, and uh, of course losing losing Russ. But uh, uh, I don't think I've ever had a full staff in my 27 years here. So <laughs> we we always find a way to, to get the work done. I'll but, do uh, more with less, right? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So thank you, uh, members okay. of the commission. That's all I have. Any more? Adjournment. Adjourn. Okay. Move to adjourn. Are adjourned. Uh, thank you. 6.21.